Jesus, we love you. You are holy. And there's none like you. There's no name like your name. So we call on you, Jesus, and we say, have your way. Have your way in this place, God. Have your way in our lives. We yield to you. We yield to you, Jesus. Remove everything that's not like you. Father, I call every thought into order in Jesus' name. I cast down every imagination in Jesus' name. I tear down every argument that has exalted itself above the knowledge of God in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, you said that your spirit would speak to us and teach us all things about Jesus, that, that your Holy Spirit would lead us in all truth. So we yield today and we ask you to lead us. Lead us in all truth. Teach us all things. God, speak to our hearts today. And I break every distraction in Jesus' name. I rebuke every enemy in Jesus' name that would think that he could come and steal the revelation that is released by the Spirit of God. I speak to every heart to be good soil, to receive the word of the Lord, to produce some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold harvest. I declare a harvest in this place in Jesus' name. And somebody shout amen. doing today if you have your Bible I'm gonna be in Romans chapter 8 for just a few short verses I got a ton of scripture but I'm only gonna read three short verses and we'll see where we go from there. How about that? Verse 14 through 17 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Somebody say led. Yeah. Not for as many as acknowledge the Spirit of God. Not for as many as hear the Spirit of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Not they are the servants of God. Amen. Not they are um, the pets of God. Not they are associates of God. But they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Somebody need to let that settle on them. you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear I'm going to sit there for a minute somebody needs to let that sit on them that you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear as someone in the room that has been worried about their health and it has put you into bondage to fear and somebody in the room that has been concerned about their parents and it has put you into bondage to fear others with jobs or economics but God has not given you a spirit that puts you into bondage to fear again why should you be in bondage to fear why would you resist freedom from that bondage why would you wrestle against the Spirit of God which has been given you to hold on to the bondage to fear that you would rather worry about it and think you have the answer for it or you can figure it out or if you rob Peter to pay Paul or take from A to get to B that you have a better answer than the Holy Spirit of the living God. I can feel the tug that when I say you don't have a spirit of bondage again to fear that there are some resisting it. 
You know that spirit don't want to let you go. And you know it's not competing with you. Here's, the, here's who he's trying to compete with. You have received the spirit of adoption. That's, the, that's who he's trying to compete with. The adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The adoption by, by which we are brought into the, to the house of God and into the family of God and into the lineage of God. Rather that fear would have you sit outside the house of God. Outside the people of God. Outside the plan of God. Outside the presence of God. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Someone is losing their inheritance because they cling to fear the way fear clings to them. You may be seated. The Bible says that we are heirs. Somebody shout heirs. That we are heirs, that we have an inheritance. We know some of the things of our inheritance are very basic, right? Uh, this is the house of God, everybody. The spirit of God reigns in this place. The goal when we come into the house of God is to be in the spirit of God. So that we can hear what the, the Spirit of the Lord is saying. If we let our flesh rise up and try to yank the service back into our preferences, our wills, our desires. One of the things about the Spirit of God is that your will and your desire die. I got five amens. No one then loves the Spirit of God because they love themselves. The Bible says in these days men would be lovers of themselves. So, one thing about the Spirit of God, I'm going to rebuke you all day if we're going to be in here like this. I've already got eyes from my wife twice from the front row like, but I don't care. Because I would rather stay home and preach to my children who I know are, are obedient than come out and preach to those who are stiff-necked and refuse to hear anyway. If you refuse to follow any small instruction, you won't hear any deep revelation. So let, let, me, let me say it again, um, that when we yank ourselves back into our flesh, if our desires and our will don't die in his presence, then we are saying we are here to quench the spirit of God. If you are here to serve you for your comfort and to quench the spirit, whose agent are you? Which is why we always have to rebuke our flesh. Um, which is a perfect intro to the message because we're dealing with two spirits. One puts us into bondage and one puts us into inheritance. We have an inheritance there. I think we, we, we think by default the things Jesus offered belongs to us. I think we think that. Uh, things like salvation. But you know, salvation is an inheritance. The Bible says we are heirs of salvation. So if you are not then led by the Spirit, then you are not a son. If you are not a son, that inheritance does not belong to you. Eternal life. We think John 3.16 gives us an all-access backstage pass to living forever. But if you are not a son, then that does not belong to you because we are the heirs of eternal life. It is part of the inheritance, the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom, the kingdom that is at hand and the kingdom that is within us. It's not about the language you speak. It's about the spirit you follow. We can talk good church. We can quote good scripture. We can have all of the right linguistics biblically. But if our heart is not led by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God does not belong to us. It is not inside of us and it is not near to us. Um, the riches of his glory, which probably 70% of people who go to churches have come for. The riches of his glory. 
They want him to pay their bills more than they want to pay their tithes. They want him to pour out exponential blessings upon their life that they will be overflowing in abundance, but they are rarely in the house of God, rarely lift up a praise, rarely submitted to the spirit, barely submitted to a leader, but we want the riches of his glory. We blame him when our things in the earth go bad, but we don't pay attention to any things that the heaven has said bring to the earth. The Bible says that the portion, that the Lord is my portion. He's the portion of my inheritance. So the Lord is my inheritance. So this is where you start finding where those who are of the inheritance, um, language and not, are divided from those who are not. Is that those who are of the inheritance are satisfied with the Lord. He don't have to give me another car. He's my Lord. He don't have to pay my bills. He's my Lord. He don't, have to, he don't have to fix my body. He's my Lord. That he is my inheritance. If I don't get nothing else, I got him. This is where, 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 where you see the difference between the sons and the servants. The servants want their wage. The sons want their father. And so there is a difference that happens. And this is where, where you'll find church congregations, again, divide right down the middle because those who don't get everything they want when they want it from God and they go through hard times, they disappear for seasons. But then those who say, come hell or high water, you can take it all as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. Those are sons and daughters that say, I just want my father. And then, after all of that, as an inheritance, Jesus says, uh, dealing with the rich young ruler and Peter, he says, you'll get a hundredfold in this day and the life to come. So it is not all to come. There's some this day in it. But, but this day ain't the focus. When Jesus told Peter that, Peter hadn't seen it yet. Peter's like, what about us? We left everything. What do we get? So, so the, the hundredfold in this day is not the first thing. That's the difference between God and the devil, is the devil will say, here's your hundred right now. And you're going to pay for it on the back end. That's why mortgage, I, I don't know who I was talking to last week, but your mortgage means death pledge. So when you get a mortgage on a home, you've made a death pledge to pay this for the entirety of your life. Right? And which is why they give it all to you up front. But on the back end... See, see, the enemy give it all to you up front. You need a $100,000 house here, but you're going to pay $300,000 for it on the back end. But God, God doesn't give it to you right up front. He wants to make sure that you are, are, are in the right place to handle that inheritance. The scripture says that we are, uh, if we're led by the Spirit, we're the sons of God, right? And then we are the heirs of God and the joint heirs with Christ. I, I, this, this settled in my spirit because we all love the language and none of us love the lifestyle of the heir. We all talk about being sons and daughters of God, talking about being children of God, and, and one of the least things we walk out is being children of God. We walk out being church members. We walk out being Christians. We, we try to walk out being the bride. Say what you mean, Pastor. You know how your bride know how to work the husband. The husbands are quiet. Even boyfriends know. <laughs> you know how the bride knows how to work the husband? No, they don't know. Here, let me explain it to you. Not my baby. Yeah, my baby. I'm talking about y'all wives. <laughs> you dating? You dating? How many? Y'all go on a date when you start, when you first meet each other? You ask her what her favorite food is, right? You better not take a nowhere. They don't serve that. When you get there, 
you better you pay him for everything. Right? That's why, that's why the boyfriend never enjoys the date. Because he's calculating your meal the whole time. <laughs> he's letting you order first. He's already chosen two selections. One from the handhelds and one from the entree. And depending on what you order, he's either going to get an entree or revert to the handheld. Why you got lobster and he got a burger is because the budget is tight. <laughs> is this true or not, guys? Yeah. Just talking to the men right now. And then he, 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 he goes and, 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 and when he marries his wife or gets ready to marry her, um, they talk about having a small wedding. How many husbands talked about having a small wedding? Just four of us, okay, four of us, five of us. How many from the day of it's gonna be a small wedding to the wedding, did that thing grow? <laughs> Was told it wasn't gonna be that much more and it grew further. <laughs> you was frustrated with it, so you went and sought counsel and your counsel told you, uh, 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 well, she only gets one wedding. Give her what she wants. The bride knows how to work the husband. And then when you get married, I mean, if you get two cars, the newest car belongs to who? If she drives that car till it's on E, what car is she taking in the morning? <laughs> if she doesn't have an idea of what she wants for dinner and asks you, and you suggest it, and she don't want it? After three or four suggestions and many words and arguments, you end up exactly where she wanted to go that she had no idea she wanted to go. Right? Mother's Day is of grand design. Father's Day doesn't exist. <laughs> Does not exist. <laughs> she said, not true. I want y'all to go, here's an experiment. In May, I want you to go to the grocery store and take a picture of the section of cards for Mother's Day. One month later, I want you to go back and take a picture of the section of cards for Father's Day. And then we will determine in June how true it is. <laughs> All that's said to say, <laughs> nothing, against, nothing against how marriage works. Because <laughs> if you get married, that's how it works. She wants it, she gets it. Um, so, so, so the bride, we have no problem trying to be the bride because we think we can work God for the promise. We like to use his love for us to get the most out of it for us. Rarely submit it to him. Honor him least of all. This is the marriage we have brought from the earth to the heaven. Right? Um, defend his children from him. His word says one thing, and we look at the world and look at him and say, but his grace. As if God is unloving and angry. And we know better. We, we answer ourselves in prayer because the bride has as much authority as the groom. Because they're one. So we, 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 we take a deep breath, listen quietly, and answer ourselves and say, thus saith the Lord. We got no problem being a bride. But being, being uh, a child of God, uh, it, it, outside of getting the excuse of being immature so we get some grace, we don't ever operate in the obedience or, or the pattern or the inheritance that's left for us because we are called heirs and I very rarely see many believers walk in heirship. Um, the Bible says we are joint heirs, co-heirs, but it does not say that we are equal heirs. This equal heirship where we think we are equal with Jesus. This idea we heard in Genesis 3. You will be like God. If you do this, you'll know good from evil being like God. 
we don't have an equal heirship with Jesus. He is Lord of all. We are not Lord of all. Right? So, so we do have to understand that there is a difference in how God hands out inheritance. That we are all co-heirs. We all have a part of the inheritance, but we have to live out our life according to this word so we know what inheritance we get. Someone is struggling with that because someone always taught you that, that if, if God did it for them, they'll do it for you. Now, I'll take the inspiration. To see how God did it for you and he's no respecter of persons. But it does not mean if he did it for you, he's going to do it for me. Because it's his plans that prevail. You would have to assume that you are walking the exact same path with the same calling and same purpose as someone else. That you get the exact same thing that they get. I'll show it to you in scripture. Jesus said the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven is unlikened to a man who, who distributed out his things and gave to one servant one five. One, two, and one, one, according to his ability. He went away to a faraway kingdom. When he came back, the one who had, who had five and made ten, he made him ruler over ten cities. That's an inheritance. The one who had two made four, he made him ruler over four cities. That's an inheritance. The one who had one buried it. That was taken from him and given to the one who had ten. Now, this does not look like equal inheritance, even though they all had a piece. This one governed 11 cities at this point, this one four, and this one got to be a resident in one of their cities. They were co-heirs, but not equal heirs. Well, some get thrones, and some are elders, and some are citizens. Even Jesus himself, the Bible says, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, yet humbled himself unto death. You might think you equal, but it's probably time to humble yourself. Because we are not equal, but we are, we, are, we are in his likeness, which means there is a pattern. There is a pattern. Um, and this is where you really have to get out of this idea that, of this separation of Jesus, or the word of God made flesh, and God himself. Because in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. The word can't be God and, and, and be separate and there be another God. I mean, God said, I'm God alone and there is none with me. Now, either he's a liar or the word or his intention or his expression which Jesus is the expression, the, vis the visible expression of the image of God, that he's, he's God, and we see here that he sets a pattern for us. You know, the word pattern in the Greek means father. Pater. Because, which is where we get paternal from. My, the, my paternal, or we need paternity. They want to test the father. Because the father sets the pattern for the household. That's why the sons look like their fathers, right? The children look like their fathers, initially. Because before there was a blood test, we need to know whose baby this is. <laughs> it's obviously hers, right? She had this baby. <laughs> but who does this baby look like? <laughs> now, he can grow out of that look later, but he better start right. We need to know who he belonged to. <laughs> and if you keep the pattern, you should keep the image of the Father throughout your growth. I think that the problem with the church today is that we look like God when we are reborn, and we grow out of his look when we think we know more than him. This is why as we become adolescents in the church or more mature in the church, we look less and less like him, and can't no one see him in us anymore. Uh, but we don't, we don't have to grow out of his look. We can stay in his pattern. Um, and so when we look then at patterns that have been set, the, the pattern setter is Jesus. He is, this is the spirit of the Father placed into flesh. The word of the Father placed into flesh. And we see later in scripture where it's described that, that we have been given the spirit of his son in our hearts. Well, the way Jesus described it is it's the Holy Spirit. So we see one faith. One God, one baptism. Um, 
so dealing with this pattern that we get from Jesus, you know, we look at him and we see his sacrifice. And then here's the pattern. We're the living sacrifice. We present ourselves as living sacrifices. It's the pattern. We follow after his footsteps. Um, we look at the pattern of the inheritance. He says, everything has been given to me. Right? So now we know that we have an inheritance. We follow in that pattern. But only if we are led of the Spirit. Somebody say led again. Led. If we're led of the Spirit. A lot of times, because this world has taught us that the Spirit of God has stopped speaking. And that all we have is, is the Scripture. Right? Um, well, Jesus says spirit and truth. So the minute you remove the spirit, well, then you have a problem. You have a different Jesus. And, and this world has taught us that, that the Holy Spirit has stopped speaking, stopped doing miracles, stopped intervening, and has taught us to worship a God that's much like the gods of Greece, which is that they have no desire to interact with us. That, that we have the rules and they do their thing and we do ours and they don't intervene, which is the difference in what we believe is the Spirit of God makes intercession. Yeah. Uh, so we have to be led of his Spirit. And we're led of his Spirit by being led of his voice. Hence my sheep know my voice. The voice of another they won't follow. They're not going to be led by the voice of another. We're led by his voice, and then we should know his voice. We, we, it's not that we know his face. You know, um, he doesn't say, my sheep know my face. He doesn't say, my sheep know my scent. He didn't say, my sheep know my appearance of a thing. And we're always trying to judge how something looks. And this looks like it's godly. And all the doors are open this way. God must have said it. And it's so easy to go. It was easy for Jonah to go to Tarshish. Open doors don't mean God is the usher. So he says, my sheep know my voice. It's all about his voice. We follow his voice. Um, no. It say the voice of another we won't follow. It don't say that the look of another we won't follow. It don't say that the rod and staff of another we won't follow. Which means then that the, em the enemy tries to emulate the voice of God. He doesn't try to emulate the correction of God. Which is why people run from the church to the world because they don't like the discipline that comes with love. And they like the, the ability to do whatever they want without discipline in a world that hates them but they call it love. Because the devil doesn't emulate God's rod and staff. He doesn't necessarily emulate the, the, the look that God would put on a thing. But he does try to emulate the sound. It's a, it's a counter word. This is, this is the, if you can get in front of the word, you can get in front of the inheritance. If you can get in front of the word and deceive with the word, you can make slaves instead of sons. Uh, that instead of them crying out, Abba, Father, they start crying out, Master. And don't even know the difference because God is our Master. It's a counter word. Um, it looks like this in Genesis. Um, God says, if you eat this, you'll die. Plain and simple. If you eat this, you'll die. It's not hard to understand. We understand that today. They have blowfish. Right? It's got to be cut the exact right way. Because if you eat this, you'll die. <laughs> Certain type of berries in the forest, they tell you which ones to avoid because if you eat this, you'll die. Gasoline has a hazard, biohazard, a hazmat symbol on it for a simple reason. If you eat this, You'll die. <laughs> they tell you to keep bleach out of the reach of children. Because there's one simple truth to it. If you eat this, you'll die. We understand that. It's not hard, hard to get. God says, if you eat this, you're going to surely die. The serpent comes in. You won't surely die. It's a counter word. 
He says the exact opposite of what God says. Uh, God says you can eat of all the trees in the forest except the one in the middle. The enemy says, did God say that you can't have any trees in the forest? This is, I mean, it, it, this is not even tough. This is, this, is, this is not even hard. God says, in the day that you eat it, you will die. The serpent, the serpent said, uh, in the day that you eat it, you'll be like God. And if God is life, then he told him the opposite of what God said. And he tries to emulate the voice of God. And so we have to be led by his voice, which means we have to know his voice. And, and, and we have to sit until we hear his voice. And we have to hone in on it until we have recognized his voice. Because his voice doesn't always sound the same. His, his voice doesn't always sound the same, but his word never changes. And so we have to learn the sound of God through spirit and truth. And let me explain it to you. God spoke to Peter through a rooster. The rooster didn't sound like Yahweh. But the truth of it was, God said, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. So the rooster spoke the same truth that Jesus did. Uh, he spoke, he spoke uh, through the donkey, right? We, we, see, we see him speak to Samuel through the voice of Eli. And so it's not the sound necessarily of who God decides to get your attention by. Because God will use what has your attention to speak to you. And so, but it has to line up with what his word has said. That's the thing is that the enemy tried to be a God to Adam and Eve, but his word didn't line up to the word of God. And that's the easy thing to decide. Scripture goes on to tell me that the Lord is my shepherd. That's why I'm led by him. The Lord is my shepherd. We don't like to be shepherded. We like to run free in the field. We don't like bedtime. We don't like dinner time. We want to eat when we want to eat, where we want to eat. Not at the table in front of the TV. Not in front of the TV in the car on the way because we're running late. Don't want a home cooked meal. We ask our kids, you hungry? They say, what's, what's, what's for dinner? They want to know what's for dinner before they decide if they're hungry or not. The other day I ordered some food. My daughter said, she said, no, I'm not hungry. I had some leftovers already. She knew I was ordering. She was sitting next to me on the couch. And I thought to myself, how mature and loving is she? She respects me and my money. <laughs> then I said, hey, Israel, where are you at? He's somewhere. Oh, he's taking pictures in the baby's room. He knew I was about to talk about him. He must have felt it. I said, Israel, I said, you hungry? He said, he said, he said, what you getting? So I told him. He said, he said, well, I ain't hungry right now because I just ate, but I'm sure later I will be. So can you order me this? I order it for him. I come in the next day, I look in the fridge, and it's still there, brand new. I said, I said, why is this not eaten? He said, oh, it's nasty. It don't taste, it don't taste like it. It, 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 it tastes too authentic. You should have went to a cheaper place. He didn't want the taste of the real thing, but that I should have went to a lesser version, a cheaper version that has invested in deception to make your tongue taste the taste that is not there. That'll preach all by itself, but that ain't the message. He was following the wrong voice. He said, but I'm going to eat it, though. I said, you darn right you're going to eat it. In a matter of words. I come in the next day, and I, I see it on the counter, and it's 80% it's eaten. And I said, I said, you ate your food? And he said, yeah. He said, you know what? It actually was really good. How did it go from not good to good? <laughs> I, t I tell you when, you, when you are hungry enough and you have abstained from deception enough, 
then you can taste and see that the Lord is good. Then you will see that he is sweeter than the honey on a honeycomb. Y'all got me preaching Chinese food, not even the Bible. <laughs> if you watch it online, they've been quiet until I start talking about lunch. They all hungry. Pass out the communion crackers. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. We don't want a shepherd, but the Lord is our shepherd, which means if we don't want to be led, then we're not, we're not part of the flock. If we don't want to be led, then the Lord is not ours. But, but, but the Lord is my shepherd, and, and so he leads me. Because as many as are led by him, those are his children. And so i got to start thinking about where does God lead me if, if I have to be led by him? I have to understand that God don't lead me to where I want to go. He don't lead me to one location. He don't lead me to one idea. He leads me wherever he leads me, wherever he want to take me. Whenever he want to take me, however he want to take me, no matter how I feel. That many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purposes that prevail. So here's where he leads me. Here's the good part. He leads me to provision. Provision. Right? Uh, he leads me in green pastures, the Bible says. It, says. it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Which means if you are in a perpetual state of lack. It don't mean that you won't ever have dead grass. It don't mean that it won't ever be brown grass. That's why you need a shepherd so he can see when it's getting low and walk you to the next green pasture. But between pastures, there may be some dry places. That's all right. You ain't lacking. You just ain't got to the abundance yet. However, if you are in a perpetual state of dry places, you are not being led of the shepherd. It's not the shepherd that roams through dry places. If you are in perpetual dry places, you might want to check the curse. You may want to lay it at the foot of the cross. Because to always be in lack means you're not being led of him. Because he said, you shall not lack. You shall not want. Leads us in green pastures. Not only that, he leads us in peace. Besides still waters, you shouldn't always be in a storm. If you are always in rocky waters, you should check the navigation. Who is leading you? Because even in rocky waters, and you can be there occasionally and Jesus be on the boat. But when he is sought after, the storms are subsided. And they become still waters. This is where he leads us. God don't lead you to argue with everybody. He don't lead you to every fight. He don't lead you to every contention. If you got a problem with every family member, and you got a problem with every employee and coworker, and you got a problem with every church member, and you got a problem with every message, and you got a problem with every rebuke, the Lord ain't leading you nowhere. Because that ain't still waters. Still waters, say, say you can bring all of that on and it don't even ruffle or ripple the waves. Um, he, he leads us in paths of righteousness. If your life does not have paths of righteousness, you ain't being led of the Lord. If Sunday morning is the most righteous it gets, <laughs> that's not the Lord leading. If you can leave here and, and flip somebody the bird when the light turned green, you ain't being led in paths of righteousness. Now, if it was a Thursday or Friday, maybe, because you done went so long without being in the house, but, but leaving the service where you've been raising the whole hand the whole time, and now you got one finger that stand out, you ain't being led right. You just, just wandered in, here, right? It's paths of righteousness. Somebody say righteousness. Now, here's the thing. He don't lead you in paths of righteousness so that you can make a name for yourself. You being recognized as somebody that's, that's great and somebody that's righteous, that's not why he leads you there. Uh, it's not you who suffered on the cross. In fact, you ain't even suffering. You ain't even suffering. Look, 
as far as death goes, I don't know one person in this room that has experienced more death than me. From the time I was 12 years old till now, I've been burying friends and family. And, and I would say this, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So because the Lord is my shepherd, guess what I know? That death ain't a thing. It's a temporary separation between this realm and the next. It's a temporary moment between taking off mortality and putting on immortality. And in a short while, yea, in a little while, he won't tarry. We'll see him again. So all of those who are dead in Christ are going to raise first. So, 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 so that ain't even suffering. Because I'm going to see him again. It might hurt in a moment, but suffering is a long time. I ain't talking about not hurting. I ain't talking about having a moment of mourning. But the reason they call patience long-suffering is because it endures. Right? None of us uh, are going through suffering. You lost your job last year. If you still without work, you ain't suffering. You foolish. Go get another job. <laughs> if she left you last year and you still sulking around, smelling her handkerchief, you're not suffering. <laughs> you soft. <laughs> get up, brush your teeth, shave your face, get a haircut, go get some all-white Air Force Ones, and go to the grocery store between 6 and 9 o'clock p.m. <laughs> I would tell you go to church to find it, but don't know woman of God, ain't no soft man like you. <laughs> he leads us in paths of righteousness. The Bible say, the Bible say none of us have suffered unto bloodshed like him. We can't even compare what we're going through to what he went through. On a scale of 1 to 10, if what he went through is a 10, what we're going through is a negative 100. So, so, so it's not for our namesake that we go through these paths of righteousness. It's for his namesake. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. We're called to do these things because it's for him, his purpose, his name, what he's doing. And if he led you to a path of righteousness... Understand that it is for his name. Therefore, your failure does not stain his name. He led you there for his namesake. You're not going to be perfect. We ain't called to be perfect. We're called to be heirs. It's the perfection of the first heir that brought us in. So if in that path we stumble, we're not utterly cast down. It's his hand that sustains us. Because it's his namesake. The enemy tries to stain his name through you. But his faithfulness outlasts every attack of the enemy. The enemy can say this and that about our God, but give it a little time and you will see the faithfulness of God outlast every lie and accusation. You cannot paint God to be unfaithful. This is why when you deal with, when you deal with, 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 um, atheists, they have such a short time mind frame, short term mind frame, because that's the only way they can ignore the goodness of God. Amen. Say what you mean, Pastor. Amen. Let me tell you. Um, they make an argument against God with a right now moment. If God is so good, how come little kids die? Okay, that's right now. That makes God look unfaithful. But if you just wait a little while, when you get there, when he sends you where you going, you will be able to see from there, just like the rich man who called out to Lazarus, that that little baby that you thought was died young has been living since you thought they were dead and they will live forever. 
So now the faithfulness of God said, I'm going to save that child forever to be in my bosom. They never even knew my name nor called out to me, yet I was close to them. They didn't have to endure the evil that was to come, the cancer that you would try to put on them, the, the, the rape or molestation that you would try to send their way. They were taken out early for the evil to come, and they never died. Now, over the course of time, God's faithfulness has endured past the lie. He leads us into the valleys of the shadow of death. It means you ain't got to like it. You just got to follow. If you're a son, you ain't got to like it. You just got to follow. Valley of the shadow of death. It's uncomfortable. But if you're a son, you walk through it. Because you're going from green pastures and still waters through a dry place to a table that's prepared for you from one pasture to the next. And his rod and his staff, his correction, his discipline, this is comfortable. You don't avoid the correction and the discipline of the shepherd. But here's where else he leads you. He leads you to a filling and then to an overflowing. He says, my cup runneth over. He leads you to an anointing. He anoints your head with oil. And then that table that he puts you at, no man can take you from that seat. When you are seated with him in heavenly places, this is the leading. No one can take you from that at all. No one can unseat you. And so much so that he does it in the presence of your enemy. He don't hide what he's doing for you from your enemies. Whoever taught us don't say what God told you out loud because the enemy listening can steal it. God don't hide what he's doing from the devil. He, he casts his seed in front of everybody. Secretly saved, privately chasing God so that the devil don't steal my destiny. Is the Lord your shepherd or not? Did the wolf ever beat the shepherd? I can't see it. Did the bear, did the lion get past the shepherd? Then what is you worried about? Maybe you should say it out loud, because it ain't the devil stealing, it's your own lack of accountability. You keeping it private, and so ain't nobody holding you to it, so you lose 10 years when you could have done it in one. You hold it in private instead of saying it in public, so you're bad with money, and so you're blowing all your investment startup cash. When someone else can look at you and say, why you got them new shoes on and you ain't got a car to drive? Why you bought that new car and, you, and God told you to start that business a year ago? Why you want to look successful before you are successful? I'm talking about this a tax write-off. <laughs> but as many as I live, <laughs> but as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. Sons of God. Son, by the word in the Greek just means a son or the immediate family, the offspring and the kinship, right? So, so if we're led by his Spirit, even though we know that it is a spirit of adoption, the way God sees us is as his offspring. We're taken back to the beginning. Sons of God, like Adam and Eve, we are his offspring, his immediate Kinship, immediate, immediate family, not distant family, not step family, not adopted family. Uh, we are his immediate family. But there is a condition. There is a condition. We must have the spirit of God. Must have. And, and which goes back to where I started, which is this world has taught us we don't need the spirit of God. We just need the rule book of God. But the Bible tells me that the law without the spirit kills, which is why a lot of Christians live a dead life, live a life that is unsuccessful with no victory. But the spirit gives life. What the law was weak to do, the spirit was able to do. So we need the spirit of God. And, and if you don't have the spirit of God, the Bible clearly says you are not his. And they taught you you don't need it. And they taught you that, that from the moment of salvation, uh, uh, you got the Holy Ghost. So you never pursued him. 
You never sought after the promise. You never drank of the Spirit. You never experienced rivers of living water. You just took it for granted that God locked himself into you. It says that if you don't have the Spirit, you are not his. Well, if you're not his, there's a reason you don't submit to the fathering of God, of the spirit of adoption. We see in the scripture how the spirit comes into, into the, the life of the believers of the early church, right? He comes into the room like a rushing mighty wind. The sound of a rushing And in comes claving tongues of fire that divide up. This tongue divides up and falls on each and every one of them. There is a, a blowing of a wind and a fire that comes down, and there is a fire baptism because the way John said it is one is coming that baptizes with spirit and fire. So there's a fire. We get this foreshadowed in the Old Testament. On Mount Carmel, Elijah has a discussion with the Israelites of the day. He says, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. If, 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 if you want to serve the gods or the Elohim of your fathers from before the flood, if you want to serve what you was raised in, if you want to serve that curse, if you want to serve that cult, if you want to serve that, that new age witchcraft, if you, want to, if you want to serve it, it's fine, but it's for me and my house. He says, we're going to serve the Lord. And he said, if God is God, if, if, if Jehovah is God, serve him. If, if, if Baal is God, serve him. And so the people said nothing. We know this story. He, he has them build an altar. He said, we're going to call on God and whoever answers by fire, that's God. Whoever answers by fire, that's God. And so we understand then that they put this sacrifice on this altar and they built this altar and they start calling down. And now we find ourselves in the story as those who are supposed to present themselves as a living sacrifice. This is us today. And we lay upon that altar. And we have lived our life in such a way that the sorcerers or the priests of Baal of this world have seduced the people. To where we are quiet about the things of God and quiet about who God really is for the sake of acceptance or tolerance or fitting in or not being rebuked by, by, by other co-Christians or whatever. And, and we lay on the altars of Baal. Uh, we say things like, I'm having a ball. We like Balenciaga. If you got money in my culture, we say you balling. Because you can't serve both God and money, right? You're going to love one and hate the other. Uh, they tell us that the earth is a ball. We skip church for football. Basketball. Baseball. <laughs> it's funny. I'd say, I'd say uh, these guys were dancing around. And maybe doing ballet. <laughs> oh, the way Richie Valen said it is, what is it? Palala ba balamba? Balamba? Bala, bala, bala. <laughs> it's Latin. Right? It comes from Latin, probably from ball. <laughs> and you would dance before this ball. <laughs> Did I say it right? No. No. Because I learned it when I was nine when the movie came out and been singing it wrong for. Long time. Para bala la bamba. Is that better? Still horribly accented. Sound all the way like Youngstown. <laughs> it's Youngstown Spanish Dan. We, um, we put our children in things growing up called the Cinderella ball. Debutantes. We say things like we have a sphere of influence. We lay ourselves on the altars of Baal. 
How's that? And then we let the priests of Baal tell us how we should dress, what we should eat, what we should drink. Is that crazy? And, and growing up or living in that world, what happens is we stay under the spiritual influence uh, that, they, that they have because they promise us spiritual fulfillment. They say, oh, you, you just need to do this and be free spirit and burn this and, and shake this at the house and put this on the wall and, and, and make sure your room is feng shui and, 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 and this is your sign and this is who you need to connect with and this is who you need to connect with and all these and follow the stars. And, and they promise all kind of spiritual fulfillment except there is none. There is none, which is why when you're into something like that, it just grows and grows. So when you start incorporating everything else, in it, because it just don't fulfill. Uh, they promise us answers from above, whether it's from Orishas or it's from whatever false gods or whatever spirits from the dead or outer space aliens. They promise us answers from above and and, and uh, they promise that they know how to make us whole. That we're incomplete because we're not being our best self. And, and we can be our best self and, and our most this and that self. And, and they got gurus that, uh, that have bad credit scores telling you how to be your best self. That you paid top dollar to be in a room. This guy went to an online course, got a certification in the, to, to teach what you, what you sitting in on that he was sitting in six months ago. Yes. Talking about uh, being whole in all of that, living sacrifice, laying on this altar. And then we find out in this foreshadowing that, that the only answer to it all was God. Yes. No matter how loud they called. They got no answer. No matter how much they danced, they got no answer. No matter how much they cut themselves, they got no answer. No matter what they promised, they got no answer. And after it happened all day and all night, after we spent all of our lives chasing after things that never satisfied, pursuing relationships and jobs and careers and some type of education that we thought would make us more acceptable or happy, none of it answered and only God answered. And Elijah calls on God, and he answers with fire. It is, it is, it is, uh, it's a crazy idea because the way he says do it, he says, okay, since y'all done, add water to it. Add so much water to it, it's impossible to burn. And this is the mindset that a lot of believers come out of the world with, um, is that you feel like, like, like God can't do anything with you because you are too bad. There's been too much water poured upon you. There's been too many things put on you that won't burn, that won't allow you to be brought into the house of God, that won't make your offering acceptable, that won't make God want to hear. We say, I'm too wet for the fire. We even see this in scripture in John 4, the, the woman at the well that we pray so much started out with Jesus with, what, what are you asking me for? I'm a Jew. I mean, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. And what dealings do we have? There's no way you should even be talking to me. But we see that God is a consuming fire. And that there is no condition that he would find you in. That he, that he could come down on and that condition would extinguish him. So when the fire came from heaven, it licked up the water and the offering. That there is no condition God can find you in that your condition stops him from consuming. That your condition stops him from being God. That your condition stops him from being faithful. This is the spirit of God. This is the condition that we find the apostles in, in Acts 2. We are not dealing with righteous, perfect men. We're dealing with John. He's one of them. It was a James and John wanted to call fire down not to be baptized in and not to prove God, but to burn the city down because they wouldn't accept their preaching. Imagine if at the beginning of this service, when no one would listen to me when I said move, if I called fire from heaven down to burn down this sanctuary. <laughs> Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you are of. This is Peter in the room. 
that, that Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, that denied Christ. He's sitting there with a lot of water on his sacrifice. And you can walk through all of the apostles or any of the 120 that were in the room that they all had a story. And I love it because even at that moment didn't mean that they got perfect. They didn't get perfect. They became heirs. They were heirs even in imperfection. Was it not Paul who had to confront Peter and say to Peter, uh, uh, you're being racist? You sit with the, with the Gentiles and eat with the Gentiles till the Jews come. Then you separate yourself and act like you're better than the Gentiles. The way Paul said is I withstood him to his face. This happened after the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We are sons of God if we are led by his Spirit. And that makes us heirs. Here's, here's, here's what happens in Scripture. Jesus tells a story, and uh, you know what, let me get, um, let me get some keys. I don't know that I need them, but I'm just going to quit when I quit. How about that? <laughs> Jesus tells a story of, a, of an owner, of our, our father, who has many plentiful things and two sons. And one of the sons comes to him and says, I want my inheritance now. And the father gives it to him, to my surprise. Which, if we don't read this story too fast, then we understand then that God has no problem giving us an inheritance here. And we have to get out of the idea that the only inheritance that we are entitled to is when we die. Or when he cracks the sky. Because the father didn't look at him like I would have looked at my son and say, hold up, boy, you ain't earned nothing. No, he gave it to him. He said, here. And he, the, he had an estate or a trust set up for him already, obviously, because the father was not dead. So this is a living will. This goes back to who Jesus really is, because if you're going to operate in a will and testament, it happens after the one who, who delegated it dies. So how could what belongs to the Father be willed to you under the death of Jesus? Except in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. But there's a, there's a living will, because God is not dead. In the house you have three types of people. You have, you have the angry son, right? And, and it's crazy because the angry son is not even really known that he's angry until the end of the story. Until the end of the story, you would assume he was the faithful son. He was the one who stayed. He was the one who endured. He was the one who worked. He was the one who picked up the responsibility. He was the faithful son. But he's the angry son. You had the prodigal son. And then you had the servants. These are the three type of people that are in the house. So with that, you have either you're going to have the spirit of the father if you're a true son. As many as are led by the spirit, those are the sons. You're going to have the spirit of the accuser of the brethren. We see this on the oldest son, right? Uh, that, that son of yours. He took and, and wasted his inheritance. Um, and then you have, have the, the spirit of flesh, which is just angry about how you benefit from the fatty calf. You never even gave me one. Now you're doing this for, for this son of yours. The older brother was, hope, was, was desiring that the younger brother just become a servant like he desired. You know, you find out in Scripture that Satan has no redeeming sacrifice. Uh, there's nothing to bring him back in. And, and, and he, he gets angry then at the sacrifice. Uh, the devil hates you because you get what he never got. That he was a worshiper and you are a worshiper. And he spent his entire existence trying to make you look like him and operate like him and have desire like him and have a nature like him. Proud, 
wanting to be lifted up, wanting to make a name for yourself, thinking more of yourself than you ought to, wanting people to be drawn to you, you wanting praise and you wanting worship and accolades and exhortation. And he spent his entire existence trying to show God you are like him and not like him. And he did it by telling you the lie that if you do it his way, he'll make you like him. Which is counter word to Jesus who said, if you do it my way, I'll make you like me. And, and so the enemy does this now, and then after he has done it all for thousands of years, and the grace of God stepped in and abounded where sin abounded. Now you just have an enemy who hates you because no matter what he did to make you look like him, he cannot get God to treat you like God did him. That God would step out himself from the throne, put him, his own self in sinful flesh, condemn that sin in the flesh, and though you hated him, rejected him, cheated on him, drove men away from him, all of these things he still says, you are a son and daughter. And so then you can always identify the spirit of the enemy, which, you're, which you may be following versus the spirit of God, because those in his spirit get angry about the justification that Jesus gives somebody else. People who sit around and hate how God is using you because they know your past. That's not the Spirit of God. People who sit around and disqualify you because they know what you have come out of. That's not the Spirit of God. And so, what the son does is he asks his father for his inheritance and as an heir I think this is where a lot of us miss it is we never ask we never ask we never say God can I have this God can you do this God can you release this God can you do this that and the other you know I, I love a decree and I love a declaration but decreeing and declaring without asking sometimes is pronouncing my own will it is it is saying what I desire and calling it law and what I desire has never been law only that which God has ever said so before I decree or declare a thing I should sit before his altars and I should say God what is it that you would have of me God would it be that you would have me go down to the pit how David said will the rocks cry out for you if you let me fall so so what would you provide here would you provide here? Would you, would you touch me here? Jesus said, ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. As an heir, how come we don't ask? This young man goes to his father and says, I want my inheritance now. If he wasn't so foolish, he would almost be wise. Because of the, the revelation that I can have it now. Jesus says, if you ask in my name, and he didn't say, he didn't say if you ask specific things in my name. He says, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. The scripture tells us that we have not because we ask not, which is crazy because as a son, there should be nothing we should be afraid to ask our parents for. And, and you know, you know what I, I have noticed as a father now for the last 23 years um, is that I have watched my children grow up in the house and some of the children are bold enough to ask for everything they want and others are not. And I have watched that strangers have asked me for more things than some of my children. And if I was sitting there in the house watching strangers ask my father and him perform it, Asking, seeing strangers ask for things and him give it. If I was in the house seeing one brother or sister asking and it be released, and I would eventually open my mouth and have because I asked. 
we have gotten away from asking God. Asking him his will, asking him his way, asking for his equipping, asking for his strength, asking for his joy, asking for his peace, asking for his patience, asking for his discipline, asking for his provision, asking for his overflow, asking for his blessing, asking for his touch upon a thing, asking for his healing, and not just asking, but asking and keep asking. I didn't get it today, I'm going to ask again tomorrow, and I'm going to ask again the day after. And it's not disobedient, and it's not rebellion, because as far as I can understand, you said I could have it anyway. You said it was for me. You said I was a co-heir. Now I have a choice as I can ask you about it, or I can think that you are a wicked or a strong master and bury my own calling because I can't ask for the equipping. And so I ask because I'm a son. I am not a stranger to the Father. I am not distant from him. I am not a first cousin. I am an immediate offspring. You know, what a lot of people have done with their inheritance, though, is they have taken it from what it was purposed for and tried to take it into another land. The blessing of God that makes rich and adds no sorrow is not to make you a great American. It is not to make you great in this world. It is not to have men admire you. All paths of righteousness are for his name's sake. And we have taken the idea of our inheritance and tried to make it in another land. Do you wonder why the favor of God seems to not hold up for you when you bury yourself in the ideas of men? Why the blessing of God seems to not make you rich and you be surrounded by sorrow when you bury yourself in the acceptance of men and the, and the, the curses of their words and trying to please them and be approved by them when you make yourself joined to a citizen of a land that does not know your father and a lot of us have moved into that land and we would love for the father to continue to finance our life in that land you know if the father continued to pipe inheritance into the foreign land, the young boy would never come home. He would never know he was in the wrong place. He would think that he was blessed and highly favored in a land that called him a foreigner. And who do the kings of this world charge tax to? The sons of foreigners. So he would live under tax. He would live under restriction. He would live under oppression, but feel like he was blessed because he was piping inheritance into a place he wasn't called. I'm glad that the father says, you know what? Here you go. Now, if you spend it in the wrong place, you got what you asked for, but you know where to come back to to ask for more. Because there has to be a homecoming for the heir. There has to be a, a turning back to the father. There has to be a, a, a turning your back on the foreigner. The thing that you thought made you loved. The thing that you thought made you accepted. The thing that you thought was success. Sometimes you got to turn your back on it to come back to the father. Because we can have our inheritance here. And we don't have to leave the father when we get it. We don't have to leave God when we get blessed. We don't have to leave God when we get healed. We don't have to leave God when we get the thing we wanted. Now that we can afford to travel, don't mean you gotta travel all the time. That's just the blessing of the Lord. Just because you, you can afford to lay up, don't mean you got to be laid up. It's not boring being with the father. The son who was angry said, you never gave me a goat to make marry with my friends. The father said, all you had to do was ask. Let me tell you about the father's house. The servants have it better than those in the world. So even the lowest level have it better. But you can make marry in the father's house. 
the gathering of friends and the blessing of God does not mean that we got to sit around and despise all good things and that we're just pining away and gnashing our teeth. No, let me tell you something. I love being in the presence of God. There is no better place that I would rather be. How the song say, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. What you have sought after, bed after bed after bed after bed, and have not found, you find in one moment in an altar. What you have sought after, job after job after job after job, and have not found, you find in one moment in worship. What you have chased after all your life, the approval of others that you have never received, you become approved even in your failure in the arms of a loving God. Having an inheritance in the Father's house is not boring. And it's a lie of the world to say something is missing from here. What's missing from here? Is love missing from here? Is peace missing from here? Is joy missing from here? What's missing from here? Is friendship missing from here? The only thing missing from here is the world. Is all the things that will cost you the inheritance. When he left the father and took that into the world, everything he did cost him everything he had. And that's why scripture says, for this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. The only thing missing from here are the things that would steal your inheritance. I think I'll finish this another time. I just want to encourage everyone in the room that you are an heir and you have to decide who you are an heir of because there's always two options spirit that puts you into bondage to fear spirit of adoption by which you cry out Abba Father which spirit are you led of because as many as are led by the spirit of God those are the sons of God those who are led by a spirit of bondage, those are sons of bondage. And we see this from the beginning. Abraham has a promise. And Sarah says, sleep with the bondwoman. And this is what the Bible says, is that cast out the bondwoman. Because there is no promise in the bondwoman. There is no inheritance in the bondwoman. But the inheritance of the promise is in the free woman. And too many have lived in the house. And just because you're in the house and can see the father have chosen to stay under the bond woman. Make me a servant in my father's house. But the bond woman shall not be the heir. I love how God takes time to pour onto us those things that we are inheriting. Because the scripture says that an inheritance given hastily does not end up blessed. That if he gave you everything in the moment before you even knew who you were, you would spend it before you even knew what it was. You would take your gift of worship and give it to a world. You would take your gift of of. of pronouncing a word and turn it into something that draws people away uh, what's giving to you too early does not end blessed heirs of the bondwoman who inherit nothing the heirs of the free woman that is of the promise we are heirs of the promise there is an inheritance and it's time that we start opening our mouths and asking God. And it's time that we start walking around, not as strangers in the land. 
when we are in this land, we are not yoked up to a foreign citizen. We are the heirs of God. I'm going to finish this next week because there's a lot more to it. Father God, I thank you for who you are. There is none like you. We thank you that you have always pointed us to this relationship. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, we pray that your kingdom come and your will be done on earth. Your living will be done on earth, the same as it is in heaven. Teach us how to walk as sons. Teach us how to walk as daughters. Teach us how to walk as those who are your offspring and kinship and immediate to you. Father, give us the boldness to ask because it is you, Jesus, that walks through the heavens. Our high priest that lets us approach the throne boldly. So show us how to ask. You've always told us to ask. You said if we knew the gift of God that was in front of us, we would ask. So, Father, show us how to ask, how to ask in your name, how to ask according to your will, how to ask boldly, Father, how to walk in the authority of an heir, how to walk in the authority of our inheritance. And in your living will, in Jesus' name, amen. I call for them keys, but I probably had another hour up here. <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes nine pages will translate into an hour and five pages into three. And you never know how the Holy Ghost is going to move a thing. When you came in, you received an envelope. The envelope says tithe and offering. We know that giving is worship. So the condition of our heart is the most important thing when it comes to giving, be it our tithe, be it our offering. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. So we give what we set in our heart to give, the Bible says. So listen to what the Spirit of God said. Be led in your giving. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those, those are the sons of God. Be led by the Holy Spirit. If you're unsure, just close your eyes and Ask, God, what is it? What more practical way to immediately apply what we have been taught? And ask, God, what is it you want me to give right now? I'll give you a moment to do that. There's digital ways you can give. If you're watching online, it is in the chat. Take a moment and ask God what it is you should give because this is worship to him. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give to your kingdom. Everything that we have comes from you. Everything. For you are our portion and our inheritance. So, Father, we give you back this, this portion, God, and we say have your way with it. Stretch it. Do more with it than is possible. You are a wonder-working God. Show yourself mighty in the giving. And Father, we yield it to you, saying that you have our heart, that we don't try to serve money before we serve you, but that we depend fully on you. And I ask that you bless the giver, that you open the windows of heaven, God, that you pour out a blessing on them. There wouldn't be room enough to receive, that it will come back to them in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Father, that it will overtake them, God, that the, that the, the, the reapers will overtake the sowers, God that the harvest will overtake, overtake the sea. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.